Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back for uh, another um, space. This one was pretty much uh, expected. You didn't have to be a genius to know that uh, we will have a space over the uh, major or so-called major turning point uh, into the global policy uh, architecture uh, or the global policy concert, <coughs> which is the election of a new president of the United States of America. Um, very quickly, um, the uh, election went as I told you guys would go from the moment he uh, was missed by the assassination attempt. And at that point, it was clear, to me at least, despite multiple voices that were trying to um, actually make of the campaign something valid. Um, this is one thing that I said from the moment he escaped um, the assassination attempt and the moment he uh, got back on his feet, pumped his fist and screamed, fight, fight, fight the tide was clear he was going to win. Not as much because of the symbolic gesture itself, but because um, the whole idea of Trump was the comeback. And then, even if we had to, uh, like some people have done, including on the uh, Timor criminal camp, deride the American political process, then you became entrapped in, into that whole process, which is like, and basically whatever happens within the dem democratic process, it's uh, basically useless. And then the decision will be done through the exposure to the so-called electorate, to different, um, high and low points, we had everything, we had dirt on Trump, which for once was extremely weird because it was dirt from the 90s. Uh, then we had uh, Kamala having her own issues, basically her being incompetent. And But if we go down that road that we uh, delegitimize the whole process, then we bo it comes down to basically the symbol, the uh, strength of the appeal, the, how the Americans call, what the Americans call the ground game. And there, unfortunately, Kamala had no chance, both logistically, because she started with a handicap, that uh, Joe Biden started the race, and also uh, the other handicaps that, according to the, vo the votes that were counted, her performance was lower than any single um, uh, Democrat candidate the last five or six elections. And also, apparently, she failed completely when it came to uh, replicating the quote-unquote success from Joe Biden, which now a lot of people are putting back into question because the number of uh, voters that came out to apparently um, disavow Trump, because that's what happened, uh, might well have been just a protest vote. Uh, such protest votes, uh, we have seen them in Europe. Uh, the Le Pen father against Chirac uh, in the early 2000s, where basically the French just went out to vote against Le Pen uh, for Chirac, that gave Chirac his uh, uh, Mobutu-style uh, score. Well, the same thing might have happened also uh, the last elections, which doesn't mean that they were, uh, in my opinion, 100% kosher. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The past is the past. Uh, in this uh, logic, as I said, is you cannot have your cake and eat it. So basically, either the uh, electoral principle in the U.S. is bullshit. So it, it boils down to uh, strongmen and uh, symbols and other such less interesting uh, views, or then you have a real process, and then the process matters. 
and at that sense, the ground game on the side of Kamala Harris was absolutely shit, which meant that on top of the fact that she was handicapped from the uh, situation with the DNC, uh, which meant that she had already lost, and what cemented her loss was literally Trump uh, going Rocky IV uh, after the uh, first assassination attempt. Uh, so the polarizing society with the crystallization to this, the first attempt at his life just basically killed the, the election and made it, uh, in a certain sense, a counter-protest vote if we want to take the f- protest vote in 2020. Anyway, that's, that's something that you might agree or not. But now Trump, that's the, the, the thing. Uh, as you may know, uh, Trump promised that within 48 hours, this once again, this is bullshit. I'm not expecting Trump to solve the situation in 48 hours. Uh, like for anything that has been said by the Americans, three days to give, uh, 48 hours to solve the crisis, three weeks to Crimea, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just box. It's, it's just a figure of speech and hyperbole, which means that uh, now Trump, which isn't the president yet, is a president-elect, but he's not president yet, will have to uh, work on to a plan to at least uh, get the Russian Senate agreements agree on ceasefire. Um, there are many plans that have been touted before. First of all, you had the uh, lose-lose plan uh, penned by Pompeo, which was threaten the Russians with infinite ammo and money and weapons for Ukrainians and threaten the Ukrainians with the exact contrary, which is, if you don't fucking negotiate, we'll cut everything and we'll let the Russians um, finish you off. The schizo approach, typical with the neocons, of course, was just bollocks. Um, even Trump cannot afford that because in the current situation, uh, threatening the Russians with infinite uh, money to the Ukrainians and infinite ammo, whatever, simply is not feasible logistically, even for the U.S. As for the sanction process that would have been, um, you know, multiplied anything, there is the other problem, and one of the results of the uh, sanction process and the uh, war, the economical war that America has forced Europe to pledge against Russia is what was going on in Germany right now, which is in uh, technical assistance for two years and whose legal limits into borrowing and uh, spending and uh, agreeing to stimulus uh, are making the... I just made the government implode. Um, the same thing is going to happen uh, in France, although France already had the problem with the no, vote of no, no confidence. In a certain sense, Macron was uh, smart because it used that uh, electroshock with the society to at least walk the dog for, let's say, six to eight months or nine months. Then the same problem is going to come back, and now they're going to be worse because France is tethered to the uh, German economy, not directly like many of the uh, Central European uh, nations that depend largely straight up for between 27% and uh, 38% of their economy um, to Germany. But, you know, slowly, slowly we'll get there when France will get sick of the German disease as well. Now, as I said, that role the, the Americans right now cannot afford to do. The full sanction, over-sanction, whatever. Uh, for the moment, the Russians are most insulated uh, from it, but the Russians themselves start need to start thinking about how to deal with um, a Trump flip around. As for the uh, second part of the schizo plan, which is, as I said, uh, threaten the Ukraine so that we can cut you off, it's simply not possible, as I said, because for the moment, uh, the Ukrainians still have about three months uh, to come with probably the 4.4 bill, uh, 5.4 billion that's still remaining on the PDA uh, about to get disbursed. Um, the main problem with the PDA is that the Ukrainians simply um, aren't benefiting from what they need the most because the production rate, stockpile rate, for what they need, which is uh, air defense t- interceptors, um, long-range weapons, and so on, other uh, l- 
politically limited or are production limited or stockpile limited. So basically, uh, if you want to spend, uh, I don't know, two billion uh, worth of PDA uh, to defend the Ukrainians uh, with two uh, Patriot batteries and a couple of missiles, you are already uh, there. And as for the rest, as I said, and but I'm going to explain it a bit later, the uh, current rate of uh, expenditure and the current rate of losses leads to believe to me that the current PDA all in will last Ukrainians about a full year for certain items and less than uh, six months for others, especially if the intensification of the uh, Russian assaults are as uh, sensible and uh, successful as they are right now. Um, so, as I said, the first plan from Pompeo is bullshit and will probably backfire if Trump tries to enforce it. Then you are here now the second plan, which is the kind of appeasement plan, which everybody is a bit criticizing and also analyzing, which is the alleged three-point plan, uh, ceasefire with a uh, demilitarized uh, line of 800 miles, so roughly the uh, major line of contact, including the borders up north. Um, then the continuous uh, procurement for the Ukrainian forces of uh, equipment and uh, weaponry in order for them to uh, sustain a hypothetical further Russian assault down the line, 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, and of course, the most important part, uh, which is the engagement from the Ukrainian side to not require a NATO membership within 20 years. The problem with this approach, um, as I said, is that once again, uh, it makes no sense. Um, first of all, everybody has pointed out the demilitarized zone needs to be verified, enforced, whatever you want from someone. And from the Trump team, what we're hearing is that the guys who need to enforce the demil zone need to be Europeans. Americans will not do it. Um, and Therefore, if we're speaking about Europeans alone, and given that uh, with the Russian participation in the United Nations Security Council, there will not be any UN peacekeeping force, and hopefully um, the Russians will keep it there, because it, that would mean that the only party that could actually be a uh, non-partisan, quote-unquote, uh, force, would either be China or some backwards country. Uh, Russians will refuse Japan, will refuse South Korea, especially after the uh, complete and utter fiasco that the South Koreans are making up for, I think, uh, an attempt from the incumbent government to change some laws in order to benefit from the war in Ukraine by selling uh, right away to Ukraine. Um, so it, the only real uh, logic there is, as I said, either a backwards country, either China. Anything else will not work. If you want to go through the UN, of course. If you want to do it um, on a bilateral phase, then it can very well be European forces, but then you're going to hit a snag with the fact that European forces currently if they have to deploy around about 1,000 uh, kilometer front and uh, they have to put enough troops in there, they would have at least to deploy 20,000 uh, troops. Basically just an observation and uh, some kind of local enforcement, which is about 20 uh, troops per kilometer. Those 20,000 troops, if we have to put them in, the, in their uh, native configuration, would mean that most of the deployable uh, forces from European nations as France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and maybe the UK would be actually already in Ukraine. Which, if we have to be honest, would be the perfect 
moment to literally eliminate the potential quick reaction force from Europe uh, to Ukraine. So there too, if you have to think in, in a more Machiav- Machiavellian way, Europeans are not going to do it. Because in order to sustain that force and protect it from a potential blitz on the, on the um, Russian side, you would have to at least triple it. And 60,000 troops from uh, any kind of European force right now would be a back-breaking exercise when it comes purely to the uh, financial part of it. Of course, people would say, yeah, but the moment the Russians attack the Europeans on Ukraine, so, well, the 300 or 280 billion euros are gone. But at that point, you are in a situation when money doesn't really matter because you just attacked a NATO force, of course, not under the NATO banner uh, in Ukraine, uh, and you are going for an all-out brawl within Ukraine, Ukraine territory after firing the first shot, which means that at that point, the Russians do not give a fuck about how much money is frozen. They are going for uh, the big one. Now, of course, having Europeans go in is also a no-go for the Russians. Um, and therefore, as I said, you are uh, facing the risk of just simply fucking over uh, the whole peace-slash-ceasefire effort by even proposing someone to survey those that, that thousand kilometer line. Um, the other problem is that the promise from the Ukrainian side of not willing to get within NATO for 20 years is useless because at the end of the day, uh, the Ukrainian side has no actual voice in the chapter. The people who will extend the invitation, who will make Ukraine a member, who will uh, actually decide to get embroiled into this war, is NATO. So in this case, is the USA. It doesn't really matter. It's literally as, uh, you know, having your puppet and having your puppet speak about some promise. It's literally Pinocchio. It doesn't really matter. So that too, that part too is absurd. And of course, a lot of people are, are starting to think, oh, but is Bonky going to uh, walk and, and take the bait and, and like, if I can think that straight, <laughs> for sure that the Russians are not going to work, walk it through. It makes no sense. We'll get to that a bit later. And then the other problem is that while you have this demilitarized zone protected by a, a, an eventual European force, um, Trump proposes to still pump weapons into Ukraine. And everybody's saying, like, yeah, this is to deter further Russian aggression, but it's not like that. Your further Russian aggression has nothing to do with the weapons. You already have, allegedly, a peacekeeping force. So the Russians have to agree to that and to allow the peacekeeping force to come in. So, on the logic, it's simply not working. Because what you're doing is you are having a operational post for the Ukrainians, saving their assets from getting uh, steamrolled at the end by the Russians, and at the same time you are rearming them. So on this basis, it's clearly not a quote-unquote well-thought peace plan or ceasefire plan. It's simply uh, Trump is going to try an operational post and through this operational post, he is going to show the Russians that he is going to literally uh, fill up to the brim the Ukrainians with weaponry and said, you know, guys, it was fun, but I'm going to unleash them into you with the new fanged weapon they have if you don't make peace. And in a certain sense, Trump has the perfect uh, solution for everybody who was shipping on, on Biden. Because Biden didn't want to escalate due to the fact that logistically he could not actually satisfy the Ukrainians given the type of attrition and amortization we have in this war. 
But if Trump manages to stop the war for a year, he would have enough time for at least to give Ukrainians a small period where they can indeed redo another uh, Kharkov or another Kherson, probably aiming at Zaporozhye. And the fact that Trump is going to propose this plan at this inauguration it means that the Russians themselves, if, let's say, uh, they are serious about discussing with Trump, they have only three months to reach positions, as I said, which would make the whole Trump plan impossible to, to achieve. One of these uh, situations is basically having the uh, Ugledar uh, salient, and the Ugladar salient, as I said, the Ugladar wall, which is becoming the Krakow salient right now, simply uh, cuts the staging and man- uh, management uh, area and maneuver area uh, on South Donetsk slash Zaporozhye. Um, so at that logic, you can see that we are not getting anywhere close to a peace deal or the ceasefire deal because whatever is being thought right now from Trump is literally trying to help Ukraine by feigning peace and it's a a more elaborate attempt to pull another March 2022 uh, from the Russians. This of course as I said has no chance of uh, succeeding mostly once again because thank God Biden was so stupid and never managed to solve the uh, logistical conundrum on the Ukrainian side. And it's logical. I'm going to tell you a bit later, guys. Uh, the U.S. right now doesn't need um, artillery manufacturing line. The U.S., and I said it to a Albanian uh, friend, um, they need a Star Wars 2.0 where they can get where they were early in 2022 when they had a full control of the battlefield. They, they had a full transparency of the battlefield in Ukraine, mostly due to the fact that the Russians needed to advance a bit like headless chickens, but also uh, in a more crazy fashion. Um, and then the Americans were just watching and then deducting and then analyzing. Um, But two years, almost three years later, we can see that that ISR on the American side has huge limitations uh, when the uh, fire ecosystem doesn't go with it. So basically, um, we are to the point right now when in 2022, the ISR the Americans were providing to the Ukrainians was great. And they had the potential and also the occasion to employ that ISR in connection with fires, long fires, short fires, tactical fires, strategic fires, whatever you want. And that led to the very symbolic 2022 for both sides. But since 2023, uh, we are into a more uh, static front line, although there are advances which means that both sides have the time to see how the maneuver is going. We are not into this uh, absolute bomb rush attempt from the Russians to capture as much as they can and then start to shed uh, some positions, but also attract the Ukrainians back. We are into a full attrition war, uh, which is putting a huge strain on the Ukrainian population, Ukrainian economy, and Ukrainian political leadership, not to speak about the army. Uh, which is paying uh, the choices made in 2022 in uh, close contact with the Americans. So for the Americans, what they need, actually, they would like some kind of Star Wars 2.0 uh, aimed at China and Russia, aimed at keeping the, uh, their position of hegemon through sensor and fires, um, but which... Um, given how their ISR is not able to help the Ukrainians uh, stop the Russians from very basic attacks. There, are, there is nothing new from the Russian side, except on Kursk, where UKAVs are still damaging the Ukrainian side pretty hard. Um, on key areas, 
we do not have anything new on the Russian side. Gliding bombs, very, you know, uh, slow and systematic grind. Then come the Iskanders from uh, specific tappings, or sometimes the Tornado S, as we saw with uh, the two deployment points, one in Sumi and the other one in uh, the Pokrovsk area. But generally speaking, as I said, right now, what we're seeing from the Russians is a quality uh, upgrade and a quality uh, search on other areas for which the Ukrainians right now, first of all, have no solution, but second of all, are trying to deny. And if you want a, a, an evidence of that, you just see how, how the uh, Ukrainian channels on both Telegram and Twitter are focusing on one thing that I said to you guys, I think two or three months ago, into glorifying skirmishes. The videos posted by the Ukrainians most of the time would be individual actions, small areas um, aimed at giving you the action rendering of the war. But in fact, this war, and both sides agree when they analyze it properly, is 90% a drone uh, spotting you, artillery raining on you, UMPK raining on you, uh, whatever, FPVs. Never mind. You get uh, pushed out of your uh, position because it's impossible to sustain it given that you are being rained upon. You are out in the open. If you're lucky, nothing happens to you. If you're unlucky, uh, FPVs, uh, Mavics, whatever, hunt you down. And then the other side pushes most of the Russians with a mechanized force, which takes losses but still advances to a certain line occupy the position, hoist the flag, prepare defenses, repel most of the time, not now, but in 2023 it was repelling uh, one or two counterattacks, and then rinse and repeat until you find yourself uh, having lost, as I said, 7% of the uh, Donetsk Oblast in three months. And you're like, holy shit, this is where this is going. And it, as I said, uh, not even I... Um, one dude from the Blackbird group said it the very first day, the same time as me, uh, that the trend was obvious for uh, Zelensky. That's why he decided to do Kursk, and that's why it backfired. And he, it is backfiring so hard. Um, now, why the the idea from Trump or whoever is um, trying to... Um, give notions to Trump over this is not going to work. Once again, as I said, it has to do with the fact that the Americans at no point managed to solve their own logistics for this kind of war, but also the Ukrainian logistics themselves. Um, the Ukrainian army doesn't have organic logistics in order to sustain the number of troops it wants to sustain. So, the Ukrainians come up and say, we have one million guys under the flag. And I'm like, yeah, it's funny. It's pretty funny. But at the same time, they don't have 10,000 trucks to be able to uh, work out the whole uh, situation uh, from left to right. From the rear to the front, up to the uh, presence to the uh, front. So what's going on most of the time is you have... Civilian trucks doing most of the uh, transportation from uh, abroad. So basically you have uh, 38-ton uh, semi-trailer, stuff like that, filled to the brim with ammunition, with uh, supplies, with uh, fuel, with vehicles. We've seen that uh, a lot of the lighter uh, APCs are taken uh, as they are, hidden into Nova Posta or whatever um, freight companies. And then they are uh, slowly put forward and uh, unloaded somewhere uh, between 150 and 300 kilometers from the front. And then you start a journey from that storage spot towards uh, a close to the front depot or dump. But most of it happens through um, a very basic a system which is at 90% civilian. So 
when I say to you that when you're going to see trucks starting to burn and uh, a lot of other stuff being damaged, the Russians are not stupid. I mean, in a certain sense they were, but they are not stupid. They perfectly understand what they should strike. And therefore, um, it's completely normal that Ukraine's going to play the victim role by saying, see, they are hitting civilian infrastructure, but they know pretty much that they are, they are militarizing mostly civilian infrastructure right now because the military one is uh, completely transparent to the Russians. But by not solving that situation, what the Ukrainian military and also the Ukrainian state is doing is it's burdening the economy. In a certain sense, it helps the economy given that it gives them jobs and that they pay for it. But that's an extra cost. Instead of having your own uh, organic um, capacity to sustain this war, you are outsourcing it, which means that the freight time for these guys is taken away from other core tasks. Let's say, I don't know, uh, export of uh, cereals, export of oil, export of whatever. So basically, you are eating your own fat when it comes to that. Yes, it's true, you get money to pay for the service from abroad, but by doing so, as I said, you are raising the inflation, you are raising the prices for internal transportation, and so on and so forth and so forth. So you have a cascading effect by going private for the Ukrainian military. On top of it, the cascading effect is, as I said, once the Russians know which service you're using, mostly due to the uh, lack of uh, intellect from uh, volunteers, lack of uh, oversight by the military command that uh, is supposed to survey and control these uh, private uh, logistic lines, you get the fact that the Russians know which uh, transshipper or freight company is doing that. And there you have uh, an Iskander or bombs falling to these areas, and you have people crying about how the Russians destroyed, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 trucks at once. And uh, we have the Russia is a terrorist state, all this bullshit. Um, in a certain sense, this issue, of course, is being... Is a treatment for a symptom, which is the moment the Ukrainians start to have a bigger uh, military footprint, which means that with more trucks, they're going to be more visible, which is going to lead to the uh, exact same situation, but this time without the capacity to um, complain about the Russians hitting civilians. So, as I said, the Ukrainians have found the best balance between propaganda and perfidy, because that's how they are. They're assholes. Man, of course, the fact that they're being attacked makes that asshole uh, situation justifiable for them. But at the very same moment, the moment you understand how they work, you are then a lot more uh, affected by their claims, even if uh, actual civilians are hurt uh, or killed, like truck drivers. Um... So, the fact that the Ukrainians do not have organic uh, logistical uh, capability means also that, as I said, um, you cannot sustain a large army as they want, and this is why the multiple efforts so far to have a proper uh, counteroffensive, be that in 2023 or in 2024 with Kursk, are actually extremely limited when you hear how many troops the Americans ha had prepared, quote-unquote, for the counter in 2023, you had anywhere from, if you were to be honest with yourself, 25,000 to 40,000, which was announced by the Americans. Uh, but at the same time, you understand that the attack all over the front, especially in Zaporozhye, would have meant roughly 25,000 as your strict minimum to try and have a breach. But because staging these guys all together would have led to colossal losses, um, every effort had to be smaller and try and come together at the last phase of the assault So while, while you were engaged. But once again, I'm going to repeat, given the 
very large transparency, if not total transparency, uh, from both sides when it comes to the battlefield, large accumulation of troops coming together and starting the assault is, well, right now, impossible. Because, especially in 2023, um, both sides could hurt each other. Russians had just started to employ massively UMPKs, and the uh, Ukrainians had uh, a large amount of HIMARS assets that they actually used uh, to track down uh, Russian artillery and air defenses. So, once you see this, you understand that for Ukraine to have those 100, 120,000 people that it would need to actually overrun the Zaporozhye axis is just impossible as it stands. On top of it, if you grab the uh, factotum given by the U.S. Department of Defense from 2022 to 2024, so roughly 32 months, and you start analyzing properly, first of the things that you see is that they have given maybe uh, four to 500 barrels of any kind of artillery from 105 to uh, 155. Um, they had given th- about 3 million worth of 155 millimeter rounds. They had given about 400 million uh, small uh, caliber ammo. But once you start analyzing it and you say, okay, let's cut it in three, to be more honest, or 2.5, um, and you add the potential helps that Ukraine is getting, you would arrive roughly at 800 million cartridges of any kind of ammo that could have been gifted to Ukraine. Let's not forget, for one year in Iraq and one year in Afghanistan, which meant a very low uh, amount of action and a counterinsurgency role, the U.S. military was shipping 1.8 billion rounds. That was a year. You have here less than a fourth of it for two and a half years given to Ukraine, which is fighting a localized, high-tempo, very hot war with losses that completely dwarf whatever the Americans were doing, even if you include the ANA, even if you include the contractors. In about 20 years, even if we're being um, optimistic for the Taliban side, you had, let's say, maybe 80,000 deceased, according to available sources. Okay, you're going to add maybe two or three more wounded, and you're still going to end up with 320,000 casualties for 20 years. Of course, you had a uh, lowering of the casualties on the American and uh, ISAF side from 2014 to 2017, and then almost nothing until the end of the war. But it's still, you need to think that based on what we know only, the Ukrainians are probably way above 400,000 casualties in two and a half years. And we're not joking here. It's not, it's not a fucking joke. On both sides, losses are, are tremendous. Even if we take Oryx, one side has lost 1,000 tanks, the other 3.4 or something, or 3.3 or 3.5. doesn't really matter. For the current conditions, this war is absolutely mind-blowing. Because as I said, the Ukrainians have lost probably the active, the whole active force of the Euronato worth of tanks. A huge chunk of the IV force of the same Euronato. Of course, you're going to say, yeah, but most of them are BMPs. Yeah, but that's the thing. 
we've seen that even if you want to call the strikers or the uh, Bradleys or whatever more survivable for the crew, the equipment dies just the same. You can, you know, try and cope that, oh, it doesn't blow up, this and that. Sure, fine. It's still lost. If you want one thing, look at course. And, and this is the whole point that we're having right now. The Ukrainians themselves do not have the equipment, do not have the investment. The Americans themselves cannot manage to start shipping, as I said, 1.82 billion small rounds to Ukrainians to sustain their war. And a rapid calculus is pretty simple. Let's say the Ukrainians get 300 billion, uh, 300, sorry, 300 million, uh, small rounds, um, and you split them per hundred. So basically an allotment of rounds per one person. And you will go at roughly 3 million people. You divide this by at least 10, because it's 10 days or 10 times you're going to refill this ammunition. You are at 300,000 people. So 300,000 military men within the Ukrainian army can fight 10 times and expend that ammunition, those 100 rounds, which is a bit more than three magazines. And once again, I'm putting everything inside, including uh, 762.51 or 760.54, which can be a DMR. So 100 rounds is going to be more or less enough for LSVD, or can be a um, PKM or uh, a M240, which will see the gunner how at least 300 rounds. So completely changed. I'm giving you a, a major value. I'm not discussing the training. And it's true that part of the training is going to be abroad from other people. So that expense is not going to be, uh, is not going to be, uh, taken off the amount that Ukraine is going to receive. But a huge part of these people are trained in Ukraine. And let's say, let's say that you're going to have them fire 200 rounds at training. 200 rounds for 1,000 people that you've trained, it's 200,000 rounds. For 10,000 people, it's 2 million rounds. And if we have to follow what the Ukrainians themselves said, which is about 35,000 people uh, with a training formation of um, 2 months, and we're roughly into this 125,000 people trained since the effort started in April, May 2024, well, multiply that by 200, you're going to have the amount of ammunition that was just spent for training, for weapon qualification, weapon familiarization, and so on. So you see that the problem is not that much that the Americans are not delivering what they promised, because they're, they're delivering a lot of what they can. Don't forget that uh, out of the uh, roughly 10 billion rounds, that America is supposed to have on its um, production sheet yearly, more than half go to the civilian market in the U.S. So you are going to get five to six billion rounds being fired by 300 plus million Americans, of which a huge chunk are gun owners, and they spend whatever they want. They're going to go for five... uh, 56 or 2.23 Remington, they're going to go for larger caliber rifles. So, right now, the Americans themselves do not have much leeway on how much they can send to the Ukrainians yearly. On top of it, you have another problem, which is the platforms. Given that initially Ukraine started with a uh, Comblock legacy, be that the M43 or the 7N. Uh, six series switching from one side to the other also needs the platforms 
uh, and it's true that Americans have a lot of uh, M16, M4s, and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, those rifles are already well amortized. And we've seen that multiple times, especially um, on some M M16s, M M4s, M16A4s that were given to the uh, Ukrainians. Of course, there were the Dimakos that had uh, wobbling issues and uh, barrel issues. Uh, then uh, Ukraine stuff has been starting to uh, contract uh, weapons. There were those 12,000 uh, weapons from the, uh, a French manufacturer, which is actually uh, a gun kit assembler. You had the uh, brands that are being shipped. You have the uh, growths that have been shipped. You have um, now the hails that actually were not able to qualify for a Bundeswehr uh, procurement, which are just shipped straight to the uh, Ukrainians now. So you see what's going on. For the moment, Ukraine is going through this uh, transition phase, which puts a strain to logistical chain from the production and procurement on the Euro European side to the shipment and employment. And you've seen it multiple times. You got these units where um, one vehicle is full of people with grots or brands or whatever, and the next M113 comes with terrorists with AKMs. So you have a quality issue, you have a sorting issue, and you have also just a quantity issue. Not enough for everybody. And this comes down to what I said uh, a bit earlier, because for the U.S., Making more bullets for Ukraine is not that much of an importance. The U.S. doesn't want to start get, you know, bogged down with a couple of billion worth of investment to produce more rounds, which the U.S. military establishment doesn't see as how it should wage war. For the U.S., as I said, they need big boys' programs, which would allow them to go fast in, fast out, and in uh, fighting, let's say, a attempt from the Chinese to take over Taiwan, what the Americans do not want is to start duking it out in Taiwan on the ground. The whole point is to cripple the Chinese Navy so to stop them from actually disembarking in Taiwan. Once the Chinese are there, they can start resupplying uh, their troops in Taiwan, then it's a bit of, of a game over. Same thing for the artillery. The vision that the uh, Americans have of the future warfare is not 17 to 28 kilometers. What the Americans want is basically send um, weaponry from two, three, four hundred kilometers, cripple uh, critical battle stations, and then go in and mop up, and within two, three, four months to be done. But it's not what we're seeing in Ukraine. What we're seeing in Ukraine is a, a, a hybrid between World War I, World War II, and I'd say a quasi-steampunk situation when you have guys in the trenches, which would easily remind you of even before World War I, and then you got drones on both sides. When you got Iskanders and Heimars and Atakans flying, and then you have uh, people just clearing trenches. The problem with the war in Ukraine is that it's true, it shouldn't push people to forget about what the big boys want as a war for later on. But at the same time, it's a, a uh, supply-intensive, manpower-intensive, and damage-intensive war. Both sides ha have been pushing the uh, casualty, quote-unquote, quality, to such heights, and you can see in a large extent with the huge admitted 
debilitating rate when it comes to limb losses, um, faculty losses, people are losing their eyes, uh, their nose, uh, one hand, two hands, a whole limbs, parts of their brain. And this is the thing. The damage that this war is doing has never been this way. Uh, people uh, try to belittle, you know, the claims by saying, oh, th this has never happened. Like, it is true. That has never happened because a lot of people who were losing a limb or whatever, either were killed on the spot, so it, it didn't matter. The guys were torn to bits. Or those who were saved, well, they, they were hit where the uh, troops could evacuate you. But here, in this war, the evacuation, the medical teams on both sides are targets, prime targets. And Ukrainians are yapping, but they started this as well. And, and this is what I want to tell you. Later on, the type of warfare that the Americans want to fight has, in, in my opinion, and for them themselves, I hope for them, Nothing to do with this grinding match. Because, first of all, let's project ourselves in a potential China-U.S. Uh, war. There is nowhere they, they can have this ground war against China with, of course, the absolute um, impossibility to um, actually deploy enough troops and have the leisure to do that without getting hit. The only area where this could happen would be North Korea or South Korea, so the Korea, Korean Peninsula. But there too, the Americans will just be outmatched in numbers, just raw numbers. By the time that the Americans try and, you know, uh, disperse and, uh, and bring up enough assets, the Chinese would have already passed to the offensive. So, for the Americans, there is no logic to invest into, I'd say, a Cold War, World War II style warfare. What they need, they need the big bada booms, they need long range, and they need to stay out of trouble for their pilots, because that's, that is going to be their only um, asset in phase one and two, in a potential or hypothetical war against China, be that for Taiwan or be that within the Asian continent. And when it comes to Russia itself, given that the Russians are going to be uh, the inferior force conventionally, especially now, well, it's going to go nuclear right away. So there is no logic for the Americans to start, you know, overproducing. Um, shit that can be used in a proxy war or can be used against a uh, technologically inferior force like uh, the Taliban or, or Iraq uh, back in the day, we are seeing it in Gaza. The rate of expenditure of the Israeli forces against people that utterly dominate is also different and the loss is both real but also uh psychological, because that's one of the things that we're hearing from the Israelis, they're exhausted from this year of war. It has never been so long for them either. So I'm going to repeat what I said. The biggest problem for Trump in Ukraine, and for the Ukrainians themselves, is that the people supposed to help them do not believe in the kind of war the Ukrainians are fighting. That's why it was so shocking for a lot of people. And even with efforts, investment, and uh, uh, cash grabbing from uh, Russian proceeds, it's not going well, because I said this before anyone else, it's a finite market for those raw resources. And unfortunately, a lot of those raw resources come from, I will not say Russian friends, but areas where, you know, the West doesn't have the monopoly of um, the moral tide. And it is becoming worse since October 7, 
Therefore, as I said already about Trump, I do not believe that Trump is going to uh, have any kind of breakthrough unless allowed by the Russians. So basically, in the three months to come, if the Russians completely uh, backflip the Ukrainian defenses in Krakow and are already dealing with Pokrovsk, um, it's the Russians who are going to dictate some terms. Because one of the things that you're hearing is that Russia will take over 20% of the territory. But right now, uh, as you maybe have already seen in the maps, um, Russia only controls about 18.05% of the territory. So, of course, those two extra percents are not that big. But where is this 2% going to come from? And, of course, it's also a figure of a speech. People are not going to say 18.05. They're going to say 20%. But also, at the same time, those 20% is the factor in of how the Russians are going to push uh, from now on. But as I said, if you are not legally recognizing that Russians have taken over that land and it's theirs, there is also nothing to say there. Because people are going to are, keep, keep going with this Korean scenario, but there is no Korean scenario there. In the Korean scenario, you had two entities fighting against each other and then figuring out a certain demarcation line. This hasn't happened yet because there is no demarcation line. Nobody is uh, going back to the Minsk agreement with, you know, a demarcation line and the 15-kilometer buffer zone on both sides. No, right now what we're hearing, especially on the Russian side, is war to the finish. At the same time, on the Ukrainian side, we're hearing, we will not cede territory. So, right now, on both sides, even for public consumption, you do not have any kind of resolution. Nobody's going to have, you know, uh, the idea to just quit. Russians, surely not, because... They are getting close to what they want, which is, first of all, take out Donbass and start threatening the neighboring oblasts. Um, second of all, the situation with the Ukrainian economy, Ukrainian uh, political uh, structure, and also the Ukrainian military is not getting better, despite that um, frenzy and that optimism they had uh, post-April 2024. And while Zelensky is lying when he said only 10% of, of the uh, funds allocated has been, have been dispersed, well, because in reality, and we spoke about this initially, out of the 60 billion that were supposed to come to um, uh, Ukraine, only about 7.8 were really a PDA, so uh, a amount to be drafted in equipment from the ready stocks. The rest were orders, and the rest were uh, grants and uh, financial uh, incentives in order to make Ukraine still work. So once again, of course, Zelensky is lying. He's Ukrainian, and, well, he's from the Sapun tribe, so he will do what that tribe is doing in Palestine. But in this case, we have another problem. In this case, we have a problem that Zelensky is lying uh, without a shame, despite the fact that he's depending on the people he's accusing of something they have not been doing. The Americans, as I said, logistically are very constrained because what they can give as a uh, PDA requires for them a series of other steps. So if they want to, as I said, disperse I don't know, 5.4 billion, a huge chunk of what Ukraine is right now, are interceptors that the Americans simply do not have or simply cannot give because they need for themselves, they also need for Israel. One of the things that we have seen uh, recently, especially with the Red Sea campaign, is that the Americans are ill-prepared against saturation strikes.
America needs to take out the firing points in order for them not to get bingo on, on interceptors and in air defenses. But Ukraine cannot do that, first of all, because fucking Russia is huge. But on the other part is that right now, on almost every front, it's Russia who has the initiative. Despite everything you see, despite the attack on Kaspersky, which, by the way, now through a new angle of the video, shows that the um, Aeropract A222 Fox Bat that attacked, attempted to attack a ship, hit next to it, not on the ship. And another Aeropract that was sent there was shot uh, mid-flight over the city of Kaspersky. So when you start doing all this together, you start understanding that now it's not only a trend. That's the whole policy, that is the whole um, vision of the war that was failed in 2022. And it justifies what I told you guys, that the Ukrainians and Americans as well chose low-hanging fruits in order to bet on the fact that Putin, that monkey, that Russia would panic. Unfortunately, in most cases, when the guy who you are trying to make, you know, doubt of himself is five times bigger than you, but also can melt you, you are just going to make him mad and more focused to what he wants. And I, I'm going to go back to our own Albanian history. We had a dude that for 25 to 30 years humiliated the Ottoman Empire by skirmishing, by uh, feigning peace, by uh, engaging with neighbors in order to have money, in order to wage his quote-unquote holy war against them. But at the end, we still got fucked. It's just the numbers. And a lot of Ukrainians right now are trying to go exactly how us in the Balkans went about the Ottoman conquest. Well, it's true, we made folk songs about how we were good and this and that, but at the end, for 400 years, we were under fucking Ottoman control. Yeah, that's an L, bro. And this is it. What you are seeing right now is the evidence of, of how short-sighted the political, military, and intellectual elite was in the West. In a certain sense, if you want to see how bad it is, just look at Germany. Germany, okay, wasn't doing that well between 20, especially after COVID, but with the war, Germany literally committed seppuku. In a certain sense, Russia as well. I mean, like, they lost a huge market with Europe. But nothing forced Germany to do that. A, a short war in Ukraine would have helped the uh, Germans a lot more because, first of all, you know, okay, politically, uh, maybe the Ukrainian state, given what we know now about the request from Russia, would have been uh, minimized and um, would have lost a lot of control of its own destiny. But less people dead, um, if we speak about a sort of finalization, although it's not that easy because there, were, there was an uh, internal control component with the Russian language, and I'm sorry, but a lot of people will not be uh, able to admit that. That close, I think, was one of the deal breakers on top of the fact that Ukrainians thought they, w they could win the war with uh, Western help. But when you see what was proposed at the beginning, in a certain sense, having a smaller army and finally being neutral and, and not swaying on, on one side to the other would have probably benefited Ukraine within the short term. Longer term, we don't know. Longer term, you never know how the Russian bear would have... Uh, awoken and, 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 and maybe uh, overreacted to what they would have perceived m for the encroachment from Europe. But on short term, it would have been a lot more beneficial and, and, and would have spared a lot of drama and, and blood and, and death and destruction. 
but at the same time, and this is what I want to tell you, at the same time, you can firmly understand how badly prepared everybody was on the Western side and how much the lack of empathy of the Russian position played. And a lot of people are just going to, you know, shoot me out of hand right away by saying, yeah, but the Americans, they were never interested. No, for the Americans, I think that they thought once they inflict enough damage to the Russians and once uh, there is this public humiliation around Kiev and Chernigov and whatever, the Russians would simply go home. This is a misconception. This is misunderstanding. This is lack of empathy, as I said. It has nothing to do with cynicism and, and exploiting this um, border war between the two uh, countries. It has just to do with the fact that for Biden at some point, they thought six months this is done. Russians are not going to get what they want, whatever they have down south. We're going to treat it like we did with uh, Kherson, which was high march to death, cut off and then force the Russians to move out. And then the next step would have been coming through Zaporozhye, coming through Dipopetrovsk, cutting the uh, land bridge, and by end of 2023, it's fine. And if you base everything that you know of the Russian military, the Russian economy, and the Russian uh, in that, in a certain sense, although they don't have that word in Russia, then you have a huge problem because you you are showing your ignorance of the case. You are showing your hubris. I already spoke about this in May 2023. One of the biggest problems that Americans had towards the Russians is that they still consider them to the lens of the Cold War. For them, the Russians are losers. They ignore all the uh, circumstances around it. They ignore the fact that they put together a system of control of everyone. Not only the Russians, everyone. Look at the sanctions. Who the fuck cares about the sanctions? I'm not saying who who respects them. I'm saying, yeah, Americans have slapped Russia with sanctions, and then what? They slapped the Chinese with sanctions. I'm going to repeat you. There is no um, international rule that allows the Americans to do that. It's just purely made on you want America, you want to uh, clear American money, while well, you behave. Once again, it's completely unilateral, and it's. A open declaration of war is just, as I said, nobody wants to uh, test the, the patience and test the um, assholeness of the Americans right now. Later, it's going to change. But right now, nobody wants that. The Chinese themselves, they are, they are having a low profile. Of course, they are having a thriving trade with the, uh, the Russians, but they are not going to uh, you know, get out of the way and start breaching the sanctions and, you know, sending armored steel. Although, as I said, there is some uh, weapons washing here and there. There is the problem with the FPVs and so on. And for this, Trump doesn't provide any other logic but a slow ante going towards the confrontation with everyone. Trump speaks peace, but he just cannot do it. The best thing Trump will do is, as I said, have a, some kind of audit in 2025 by saying, listen, you got 50 billion from the G7 and you got 60 billion from us. What did you do with those 100, 110? Of course, this is bullshit because most of that money uh, will not be for the military. Most of that money would be just in order to have still something called Ukraine. Uh, and most of that money will be spent into European and American uh, MICs up to a certain term, which is from nine months to uh, 48 months for some systems. So we will have the same kind of nonsense that Zelensky was uh, complaining about towards Biden by saying, oh, we only have only had 
while knowing pretty well that for most of it, there was not much else that the Americans could give them, unless, of course, they went completely crazy and they started to give them jasmine and tomahawks and shit like that, or larger amounts of uh, equipment, like, for instance, I said, three, four hundred Abrams and a thousand Bradleys. But that would then impact the Americans' uh, active fleets. And in order to prepare all that thing from multiple units, it would have still have taken six to uh, six months to a year. So in a certain sense, what Zelensky did now with Biden, that he complained about the 10%, is what's going to happen to them next year when Trump is going to look uh, the Ukrainians in the eye and say, you had your aid, although the Ukrainians would not have much of it or most of it. And by that moment, the Ukrainians are going to start losing uh, patience, making political mistakes and have another delay like last year, which lasted from October to April. The delay probably is going to be shorter because this time Trump uh, controls everything, has a trifecta. So it's going to just be a case of Trump willing or not willing to give them what they want. And that's the only real um, breakthrough for this war. For the rest, as I said, if Biden loads the the bases right now, from now to January, Ukrainians are going to have enough uh, stuff, enough supplies to keep going uh, through at least June 2024, uh, 2025, sorry. Plus, Europeans are into this uh, in-and-out mode where um, they are still spending that money. Is it efficient? You can judge by the Pavel Initiative for the Artillery. Uh, we are now way uh, in November, but we haven't seen any real thing, any real number. Pavel still says that the, within the last two months is going to deliver, uh, I think, almost 300,000 pieces. But... I would beg to differ. I say that, like, with everything, and now we hear, as I said, we learned that Pol- Poland hasn't given the money in order to uh, supply the, um, the Ukrainians, but the reality is that there's just not enough in the market for them to buy. And if you want to place orders, it's going to be uh, 5,000 pieces there, 10,000 pieces there, and so on, and so forth. If you check... Um, on the factotum that the Americans uh, produced, you're going to notice some very weird things. For instance, 130 millimeter ammunition uh, within three years is about 40,000 pieces. And like the 122 from America and like the grads, the 60,000 grads, those come from Serbia. Maybe directly, maybe not directly, but those come from Serbia. And, and unfortunately, the, you got a, almost half a million worth of dollars in, uh, in expenditure. But you see that the amounts, 40,000, 40,000, 60,000, for two and a half years are still extremely limited. You are at 140,000 uh, pieces, Let's say that you divide us in 24 months instead of 32, and you are still at, at the poultry that you can start grabbing from all these countries, be that India, Serbia, Azerbaijan, and so on. Simply because the ammunition production is handicapped. You can see how the Ukrainians themselves ha- are having problems with. If you go to sensor.net, there is a very funny video that comes uh, in the wake of uh, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense saying that they are now producing millions of uh, mortar rounds of any kind. We did a small math uh, within the group and we found out that they, these guys need, uh, need at least 2,000 tons of explosives to produce those millions, at least 2 million uh, mortar rounds of any kind of type. And that video from sensor.net uh, was showing that 2 million might already be a huge stretch but from the bass they had received of 120 uh, millimeter rounds um, one out of ten was working 
because they are using surrogate explosives, which, which is Amatol. They're using a, a derivative of uh, ammonium in order to manufacture an explosive which is not as performant as TNT, but as also a lot of misfires. And this is a story for the Ukrainians and the Soviets and the Russians, a story older than life, because uh, already in World War One and World War Two, the Russians and then the Soviets started to produce Amatol. And that was, and this is one of the things that needs to be admitted by the the Soviets, that situation was solved by uh, TNT imports from the U.S. to the land lease. But for the Ukrainians, they do not have that. We are simply not in the same scale. And everything on those mortar rounds that Ukrainians said themselves, which were misfiring 9 out of 10, they had also other problems. The uh, shells were not good. They would expand within the tube and, and get stuck. The charges were uh, low-power charges, uh, solid low-power charges, instead of being full uh, set power charges that are in small um, ductile bags that you need to um, patch together at the tail of the uh, mortar round. And the expulsion uh, slug that you need to put on the butt of the mortar, which would hit the spigot and go up, that those also would break and the powder charge with them would be sometimes of bad quality or wet. Why I'm giving this example is just to say that the choke point logistically for the Ukrainians is everywhere, is both at the quality, at the quantity, uh, it's due to the market, it's due to the evolution of the market, it's due to the evolution of uh, how the people who are trying to help Ukraine think about war, and also how they envision war against any kind of foe, which for them needs to be from a position of uh, superiority technologically. But in Ukraine, that's the complete opposite. And yes, it's fine to show off uh, FPVs, it's fine to show gore, uh, and it's fine to show videos of how you destroy the uh, 10 tanks and BMPs out of 30. But the reality is that they're losing ground and qualitatively they have a huge problem. Now we ha- are hearing about the Grim uh, or Grom 2 that's going to be used, but we're going to wait for it until June, July 2025. And meanwhile, they're sending the archetype of... Um, perfidy by having converted uh, ultralight aircraft still with their civilian garb which as I said given that it's an aircraft is perfidy because you're using a civilian a protected um, category you're disguising a weapon with it and one more what more do you want to, to say on one side you're having this bullshit about how you you have billions of mortar rounds and how you are producing 20, 40, 50 gajillion worth of Bogdanas uh, and then you send converted ULA thousand kilometers from there by taking advantage of the aid and guidance of the Americans which, by the way, are complicit in, in an act of terrorism or a war crime, depends how you want to see it. That is a perfidy because you're using uh, a civilian plane without re- re- rebranding it or uh, making it clear that it is a, a weapon. Uh, or, as I said, you can always be uh, accused of using a DUI a terror weapon just think about 9-11 and it's not even the first time that the first attack on Kerch was a bona fide terrorist attack so this is the, the real war and what Trump is proposing 
is a view of the world that has no boundary close to reality. It's not even connected to reality, but it is not even close to making people think it's going to be real. On top of it, Trump allegedly, Trump's plan still wants to keep the territory that Russia would still control and which uh, it calls its own unrecognized. So the people in those territories, doesn't matter who they are, they're going to be in limbo. So for people who have any kind of belief that Trump is going to solve this, going to bring peace or whatever, forget about it. What Trump, what Trump's going to do is put Ukraine in, in such a place that they are going to try and sue for peace, but it would depend how long it would take. And one such case is Kursk. In Kursk right now, if you uh, hear people like Gay Forcher uh, or Sintue, Gay Sintue, now he's saying like the Russians have restarted another offensive, but we have geolocations uh, of the Russians being beyond Pogrebki. So roughly the way we see this in Kursk, they are at the 400 square kilometers of real control. There was the news as well that uh, from Bezgulaya that she said um, Sierski was thinking about pulling out. We had these uh, these images of uh, GMZ two and GMZ three mine layers being pressed into action. Uh, somewhere outside of course, probably around the region of Sumi, which means that in the best case scenario, they are going to mine the border. In the worst case scenario, they're going to mine around Suja and around the areas they can defend that are on the height. And that's it. That's what, what you need to know. They are going to be full defensive, uh, try to uh, inflict as much damage as they want, uh, thrash the place before leaving, and they're going to leave. And people are going to say, oh, but what about Kursk? And I, uh, it's exactly what I, what I said, what a lot of people have said, that Kursk was a absolutely horrendous PR show that uh, came with a potential um, fait accompli, which would then press the Americans to help them out. Biden didn't follow up, and I know why, simply because following up in Kursk and having the Ukraine still beat would have, in my opinion, um, given full throttle carte blanche to the Russians to annihilate the uh, energy sector this winter. And I think the Russians want to do it right now, but what they first want to do is finish off uh, the small bits in southern Donetsk first, put the Ukrainians before a dilemma, which actually m many people said they created themselves with Kursk, but Kursk in this new dilemma is, has completely nothing to do. Uh, either go for um, the defense of Pokrovsk and Minograd and so on, Either go for Velika Novosilka because they're going to spill over into Zaporozhye. And I told you guys, the moment they spill over, over Zaporozhye and they take 20, 25, even 30 kilometers in depth over the whole 140 kilometers, then your whole gambit with Kursk is done. Kursk created so much more problems for the Ukrainians because you remember that a lot of people were complaining about Pokrovsk first and foremost but then the plan, the Russian plan went to motion in Pretistivka which they took after only one month of preparation for the whole area and then they pressed, they got to Gledar, then they pressed, they got uh, Zolotaniva, then they pressed, they got uh, the whole 
um, uh, Prekai over uh, Zoltan Niva, Persistivka, and Ugedar, which is Bulgarian, Bulgar- Bulgar- Shaktas, and Ukrainka. And now they're in Trudove, they're going to go in Uspenivka, they're probably already fighting for Uspenivka. That's it. That's your biggest problem, because now the Russians are close to unifying the whole front. I told you, it's about 60 kilometers of wall. Which means that you're going to have multiple salients due to the fact that from Ugledar to, no, to Velika Novosilka you have about uh, 30 kilometers, but after that it's empty. And of course, this doesn't mean that the Russians are just going to fucking vault everywhere. It's not that. It's just that now the Ukrainians, as I said, are going to be in the reverse situation when they're going to have a lot less background, a lot less backfield in order to hide their staging points and the defensive points. And all this, I'm going to be mean, it's not all of this because of Kursk, of course not. But Kursk makes all this thing far worse than it was supposed to be. And on top of it, if it becomes true right away that Sirsk is moving out, then there is no benefit. On the Ukrainian side, you have no more Kursk, uh, about 1,400 kilometers lost in the worst places ever, uh, as a minimum, and now Trump as a president. Which still, in a certain sense, by trying to force you to have a ceasefire, is going to humiliate you. Because suddenly, uh, like, just shut the fuck up. Take the deal and move on. Maybe you're going to prepare something for you to counterattack later on and everything. But the situation, if it stays like this, it's not going to be um, positive for neither side. But Ukraine is going to be hurt the most. Because after the war for Ukraine will come a, a, a moment where they're going to have to reckon with everything they did wrong for not two, three, four, five years, but since 2013. The rebuilding is one thing. Uh, the pace of the rebuilding, the uh, funding is another thing. And the hyperinflation that awaits Ukraine at the war end is going to be a, a thing of beauty. It's going to be a double tsunami for them. Not enough people to rebuild uh, on time. The cost is going to fucking boil over, especially if there is not a definitive solution. Because that's the problem with Trump. What Trump is trying to do here cannot afford Ukraine peace of mind because the situation with Russia is not going to be solved. And because you will not have a final solution for this, Yes, I said it. It means that you do not have the certainty that you can start the rebuilding properly. On top of it, Russia will insist on its 300 billion. And you can pretend that you don't hear them. You can pretend that you don't want to do it. But because your solution allegedly, when it comes to term plan, is temporary. It means that what you're doing for Ukraine right now is a worse deal than accepting and forcing Ukrainians to take the, you know, bite the bullet, bite the pillow, whatever you want to call it, forego the four blast plus Crimea. shrink a little bit the army, have some kind of uh, better guarantees that I had in, in Budapest and hope for the best. Because after all, that's what Ukraine has been doing for the last almost three years. I said it's 50% planning and 50% inshallah. And once again, I go back to Kursk. Kursk is the best example of that. So, 
biggest problem I'm going to have right now is for Trump to lay out a, not a peace plan, but an action plan. If Trump has his action plan and suddenly that reads like, I'm going to give 200 billion to the Ukrainians, then it's just more war, guys. It's not going to change anything. If Trump's action plan starts with um, a solid proposal which would not immediately recognize the oblasts as Russian, because I said once again, one of the biggest problems of that option is that at least one oblast is not defensible. One oblast is absolutely useless to take over fully. Kherson, unfortunately, is militarily undefensible given the connect between um, Oleshki and the Kherson beyond the Dnieper. And if you want to establish a demilitarized zone from that border, that means that Mikolaev is a demilitarized zone, which means that sometimes in the future, 10, 20, 30 years, Russia is going to fucking rush to Nikolaev and going to take the city. And once they take the city, then they can fuck over Yuzhnoi, and then they can fuck over Odessa. And it's done. Yuzhnoi to the Moscow, Odessa, and it's done. You're done. Ukraine as a, a viable economic entity is done. Of course, you're going to have a problem because and then there's a junction with the PMR and the threat of a larger war is going to be looming, but it would still be a net minus for Ukraine. So that too, from purely, as I said, purely tactical and practical point of view, is just not something that's going to happen. So what? First of all, Kherson is a symbol. Second of all, uh, the only solution for that would be a territorial swap. But what you're going to give us territory? A chunk of Zaporozhye is also beyond the Dnieper. So what? You're going to give areas in Dnieper Petrovsk? That's going to create a salient. Nobody, nobody wants that. So the situation within the oblasts themselves is so complicated that nobody can uh, make peace right away. And this would require, if we have to follow the normal Russian thinking, a expanse of their operations within the Petrovsk Oblast. As some kind of, let's say it as this, um, guarantee that nobody's going to try to have funny thoughts about their song. And this is one thing I had discussed about, I think, three or four months ago. The geography of Ukraine, geography of the oblast that the Russians have uh, annexed, makes it impossible for the Russians to stop the war where they want. Unless Ukraine doesn't have the capacity to defend itself all over the, the front line. Which means that a, another requirement from the Russian side to the Ukrainian side will be a very small pocket army. And when you read what the Russians wanted from the Ukrainians in March 2022, it makes complete sense. A very small officer corps, uh, about 200 uh, long-range fire systems, artillery, and uh, multiple rocket launchers. Um, a Barbie Air Force, a pocket Air Force, and also such large demilitarized areas, which honestly cannot work without the smaller army. And that's it. Given what was rejected in March 2022, 
and what the Russians would need to make anything work with, you know, a demilitarized area and anything. We would, for at least a huge part when it comes to anything else but territory, would have to work with 2022, March 2022. But we know that thing is not going to work. I'm not even speaking about the uh, official language to be Russian, the second official language to be Russian. So we are in such a completely mad situation that Trump, the only thing he can do is just uh, by his actions just bring Ukraine to the brink. Pressuring them to negotiate while Ukraine are losing on the battlefield. Uh, negatively pressuring the Russians by trying to threaten them and then of course Russia's are going to re respond on the battlefield. You can see what's going on. I mean, the Ukrainians attack Kaspisk, and then the Russians uh, rain fucking ground in Kiev, and uh, kept bombing other stuff. It's, it's just now a matter of pressure and pain threshold. And in 2024 already, Ukrainians are cracking. Uh, imagine the same thing in 2025, and Hopefully not, but 2026. It, it is as simple as that, guys. So the only thing that remains is that Trump either becomes full pro-Ukrainian, and then we're going to have an acceleration of the war, a worsening of the war, worsening of casualties, worsening of losses, and we're going to uh, hit a, a point where uh, both sides are going to just go beyond Trump and beyond the quote-unquote allies and going to start having their own peace uh, negotiations, which of course are going to be detrimental to Ukraine uh, in a sense because um, it's going to be a zero-sum game. Or we're going to have Trump as I think he's going to be, which is clumsy and counterproductive for Ukraine, but not being pro-Russia or positive for Russia either, because what he's going to push the Russians to do is more THD, and more THD means only one thing, um, a far more important period of... Um, healing between the two sides. A lot of people are saying, what the fuck are you saying? Like, they, they are killing each other. What the hell is this? I'm telling you guys, it's too close for this, the two sides to be far apart. That's why this war is so vicious. I'm not I'm not the kind of guy who says, yeah, these guys are brothers, the brother of the war. I know a lot of people think like that. I'm not. Right now, there are two different entities uh, killing each other, but because they are so close, so related, that's why it's so vicious, so cruel, and so awful. And that's why the worst on both sides are, are popping out. And that's why the graft, the corruption, the theft on both sides is, is jumping to the eye. And that one side tries to fix it, and the other side is thriving on it, on that corruption. I look, look at Sternenko's case. That motherfucker is a, a criminal, a murderer. And he's a poster boy for uh, other mentally deranged people and ask for money in order to be able to post gore shit. This is how this war is going, guys. We are going to a worsening of everything. Uh, well, I'm not speaking about ethics. We're not speaking about... Um, retinue no it's just going to be worse and worse and worse and worse up to a point when one of the sides is going to break and it seems it looks like the Ukrainians are going to break first and that's it and that, then it's going to be game and there is how Trump either as I said is going to be clumsy either it's going to be pro-Ukraine and which is going to cause such large devastation on both sides that they're going to just bypass that, that idiot if he does that. So that's it. If you were expecting Trump to solve the war right away, 
couple of days after his uh, investiture, after his inauguration. My opinion is that forget about it. What he's going to cause if he keeps his line is, as I said, uh, a counterproductive effort for Ukraine. And also he's going to make Europe pay in the strict sense, which means that Europe is going to get a lot worse economically and the whole system will not crash, but will go very close to uh, going full tilt. We have the Germans going full tilt right now. Uh, we're going to have the French. And then we're going to have a domino effect simply because Germany affects everyone in Europe. And on top of it, whatever you think about the you know war ending and Europe recouping some of its losses by reinvesting and rebuilding Ukraine, um, Ukrainians themselves are not going to be, have the money to pay back the cost of the reconstruction. And even if somehow you uh, you know take over the uh, Russian funds. The cost of the reconstruction, the inflation they're going to hit Ukraine, is going to just melt out those 280 billions, and the the real uh, potential, you know, investment you're going to have from that is going to be halved. On top of it, one of the things that happen when you have these uh, periods of acceleration on on any, everything, investment, building, you're going to have a lot of speculation that comes through to that. And you're going to have new players benefiting from the end of the war. Um, you're going to have, of course, a lot of underground uh, creatures that are going to get upground and make a lot of money. Um, the fragility of the Ukrainian system that has been rendered worse by um, Zelezhido doing his bullshit is going to cost them even more time, time lost. Uh, I know that you guys saw the the Poroshenko plan. One of the points of the Poroshenko plan was keep the sanctions on. No shit, of course you want that. But the problem is that sanctions staying on in a uh, peace negotiation means that there are no negotiations no more. But imagine you're going to have a, a bunch of hardliners trying to shit themselves into... Uh, the spot of Zhelia by proposing this kind of nonsense and not being able, because that's, that's the thing as well, they're not going to be able, uh, Poroshenko says himself, no uh, territorial concessions. I'm like, bro, it's not up to you to decide. Right now, if you're going to be all hardlinish while you failed in 2014 and 50, the only thing that's going to happen under a Trump umbrella, is going to be a worse deal than Trump signed for Afghanistan, which was supposed to be a, a you know, cool and nice and smooth transition, and that became the absolute shit show of 2021, when the uh, Afghan National Army was decimated in, in a blitz so hard that they decided just to throw the guns away. And you had a, a Saigon from Wish, but you had Saigon scenes. And we joke about uh, this by saying that Zhelia is going to get gamed, but everybody else in, in that madhouse of a country is not thinking different from Zhelia. It's even worse. It's a kind of uh, mirror image of Russia where everybody right now wants to end the Ukrainians. And Putin seems the softest. And because of the whole Zrada mentality, so basically the betrayal mentality, because they are now saying that Biden betrayed us, so uh, Trump is just going to finish the job, there, there is going to be no way for Ukraine to have a stable transition from the state of war to the state of reconstruction if it would entail accepting legal border transformation, alterations following a military action. 
This, of course, is nothing, as I said, because we already have the uh, case of Kosovo. But once again, if you think that Trump is going to have it easy and gonna, is going to solve this war quickly, forget about it. The only options that Trump has right now are all bad. And they're all bad for Ukraine as, as starters. Uh, him being hardcore pro-Ukrainian is just going to uh, accelerate the death and destruction in Ukraine. He pressuring Ukrainians to make concessions is probably uh, put Zelensky in a situation where he's going to be at a loss every single time. And finally, him trying to cajole Putin into accepting some uh, concessions that are uh, contrary to everything that the Russian leadership has been doing right now. As I said, uh, having a uh, embargo period of 20 years on Ukraine requesting a PAM or MAP makes no sense because at the end, the, the ones who decide, as I said, are the Americans. So the only options that are remaining is Trump trying his best and getting the worst for Ukraine, of course. You know, like, there is this uh, French movie, Les Bronzés Fonds du Ski, uh, where you got a character who's an absolute loser, and he said, uh, through a uh, misunderstanding, maybe it can pass through, and that's exactly what, what Trump might well do, which is uh, bullshit both sides so badly that uh, they, they they see through to how uh, disorganized and how um, much worse the options that Trump's going to put on the table are going to be for both sides. And they're just going to say, you know what? I, I think we've we've lost enough here. And of course, Zelensky is going to try and sell this in a different way, but it's going to be a great loss. Now, once again, this is for a situation right now. We will have to see what effect will have this alleged massive uh, transfer of equipment from uh, the Biden administration. Um, I'm not expecting much, except for, as I said, uh, we'll see how the, the GSOs are going to affect the Russian uh, local um, storage units and staging points. And also the most important part, this is the the... the big, you know, question mark is how much is America ready to give to Ukraine in order to enable them for some kind of ground action because, uh, you know, GSO anyway, GSO uh, as, as, uh, SDB and so on we are still speaking about uh, contactless fighting, distance fighting um, Ukraine has a problem of boots on the ground, of vehicles of, as I said, logistics of equipment, but also of supplies. And that thing, for the moment, hasn't been sold. And in order for the uh, Americans to solve it, it would mean depleting the American market uh, for two, three, four years. And this, of course, is not something that's going to happen. And I told you why, because the um, uh, investment that Americans will have to do in order for them to uh, be able to supply the Ukrainians with enough uh, ammunition and, and so forth would be huge white elephants once this war ends. You will have a surplus uh, of a uh, fixed capital that it would be a automatic self-destruction the moment it, it stops. And also, the, the threat is that once the war stops and the Americans try to still benefit from this, it's going to break the, uh, the market both for ammunition uh, within America, but also the foreign market. Americans are going to just go, go around and, and handing uh, five cent, uh, 556 NATO, whereas it costs almost 80 cents for the, uh, 80 euro cents for Europeans to make. So that too is a problem. That too is something that Americans understand and Europeans understand themselves. That's it, guys. Um, that's that's uh, 
the, the, the whole space today. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much for being here. If you have questions, if you want to uh, intervene, it's up to you. Um, yeah. Yeah, and are you, and then uh, Bodhisattva. Yeah, and you can you can start if you. Want. Oh, hello. Oh. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Am I here? Okay. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for the space. And I got two questions, actually. The first one is about your, of course, your thinking about Trump and about Zelensky in a rational way. And as Kursk showed us, they don't really act that way. They're more uh, concerned about their own power base and their own power, uh, yeah, their own support. And about Trump being pro-Ukrainian, I wonder if that would benefit Zelensky and their as. Uh, some years ago, I remember reading Trap, Trap Dion talking about the key of intelligence. Yeah. And perhaps that would, the destruction of the Ukrainian country would actually benefit um, Zel, Zelensky in the short term. And the second part is about the, the Europeans, especially as Germany recently is planning on, even though their economy is really suffering, you're planning on reintroducing um, conscription and so on and so forth. So I wonder what, how could that, um, factor into all the conversation, all the, all the, yeah, into the matrix. Well, thank you very much for the questions. They are very interesting. Uh, I'm going to first start with the German question because, uh, it's of course the most important part. Um, very recently the German Bundeswehr has, uh, issued um, white book for uh, procurement and expenditure and so on. Um, this was made uh, available to me uh, by Fran Fran24, a very nice guy, great guy to follow. Um, I had already an idea how, to how the uh, Germans were going to operate, uh, but I had no idea that they were so... Um, uh, impacted by the economic crisis because, you know, uh, in 2022, Scholz uh, prepared a special fund uh, which would rejuvenate the uh, German army, German armed forces that would uh, give way to a, a stronger German military industrial complex. But when you see the expenditure and when you see what is already affected, what is already being uh, spent and, and invested, uh, the German military uh, is not going anywhere. Even if they want to introduce uh, conscription, they simply do not have the means, uh, as it stands right now, to have a large conscription, which would mean at least 150,000 extra people. Right now, the German military would need and we need to pay about 25,000 to 50,000 extra uh, professional soldiers which would eat most of the uh, special funding once you factor the uh, procurement of the helicopters, planes, uh, new tanks, modernization of tanks, modernization of equipment, a modernization of the uh, shelter and uh, payment for the German military. So basically, the German military with a hundred billion would be qualitatively superior to what it is right now, but because it's the, the, the quality, the readiness of the German army is so low, it would barely make a dent to what they really need in order to um, be this, you know, uh, European leader when it comes to the defense uh, sector. One, this, this has to be said as well, that the German situation uh, and the German... Uh, problems are shared by most in Europe. 
for instance, you just need to see the UK. The UK has given every single AS-90 uh, to the Ukrainians. And they reduced to have, I think, 24 uh, 155 millimeter uh, barrel artillery for a military which is supposed to be the size of the Ukrainian military pre-war. Um, you can understand how uh, problematic the NATO alliance has been for most uh, European uh, nations, especially when it comes to the peace inflation, as I call it, which is due to the fact that America would guarantee, the American umbrella would guarantee uh, the supply lines, the uh, market supply chains, and more or less, let's say, the uh, you know the providence and the benefit for the whole Western bloc. Um, the Europeans simply went along with the fact that okay, we are getting demilitarized; we cannot sell as much. Our military industrial complex and our, our military, especially when you see the French ones, is uh, highly dependent on, on exports and on the export markets. Well, uh, they were forced to give huge discounts and find uh, alternative solutions uh, due to the financial and uh, political firepower of the U.S. Um, I have said it multiple times, I'm going to find the white book in 994 from the French Ministry of Defense, uh, which uh, shows that America had penetrated through the Cold War most of the uh, French industrial projects, um, which, uh, well, it's pretty simple. Um, America had a finger on every single you know, new project that the French wanted to uh, establish uh, could block almost every single one of them. Uh, the ITER clause, which uh, stops uh, both procurement to third parties with uh, equipment which would entail American parts, but also um, sanctions, unilateral sanctions. I mean, CATSA stops pretty much any kind of uh Re-equipment for multiple markets would be beneficial to the French. Uh, Katza stops any kind of Iranian uh, uh, interest. Katza for a long while uh, was blocking Turkey. Um, and Katza would keep blocking a lot of markets outside of uh, uh, the um, small club of NATO. Uh, the biggest problem I, I have with with uh, Europe as a military power right now uh, is also we don't have the most basic thing, which is what would be the common language, the inter interoperability language. Is it going to be English? If it's English, yes, it would make sense due to the fact that NATO is uh, over, uh, you know, uh, hanged by the... Um, uh, American power, but beyond that, what? Are you going to have a Lithuanian contingent fighting with a Spanish one? Those guys are going to uh, start, you know, exchanging horrible uh, English accents, and the cacophonia out of that would be problematic. Then you also will have the means. America is this huge, you know, block. And they have the, a, a uh, streamlined budget and whatever. But then you have to deal with the French uh, logistical line, which would need to also integrate, I don't know, the Albanian logistics, where we have like 10 trucks and those guys have 20,000. You know, like the whole uh, logic of a European army, given how uh, diverse Europe is, um, is a problem on itself, on top of the fact that you have American control, but it's like everything is in there, the economy, the uh, geography, um, the political dominance of the U.S., the fact that some uh, members of NATO, like Turkey, uh, have a completely different interest than France or than Poland. So I wouldn't start uh, banking on a uh, European uh, military yet or a German-led European military. When it comes to Trump himself and uh, his posture and to Zelensky himself, uh, that's not a big deal. I mean, Zelensky is benefiting from the fact that he crushed most of the opposition within the country through the war. Snek has spoken 
uh, in long about this. But the fact that um, Trump now is going to be pro-Ukraine and going to solidify uh, Zelensky's um, stature, in a certain sense, this is going to uh, backfire badly. Not that much on Trump. Trump doesn't care, but on Zelensky himself. Because so far, what, uh, and you said it, when you see at Kursk, they are not rational actors. Actually, in a certain sense, they, they, there is a method to the madness, Zelensky. But what Zelensky didn't say is actually a lot worse than what he did. For Zelensky, as I said, he, by doing Kursk, he recognized that the chances that the same investment in Donbass would have been more uh, important was a failure. So basically, by doing Kursk, Zelensky recognized that Donbass was a failure. But this, because of, as you said, Zelensky had, uh, uh, you know, taken over Ukraine uh, in the Ukrainian political system, uh, was passed as a huge victory. I mean, everybody and, and their mother uh, sang on how fucking Zelensky is great and how everything is fine. And this is a mistake. It's not a, a simple mistake on Zelensky's part. It's a mistake on those who backed him through 23 and 24 when clearly he had lost uh, sight on the target. I mean, we all remember those articles when Zelensky was getting shit pushed through in Zaporozhye, and suddenly asked people to do an attack in Golovka while he was depleting most of his uh, forces in th three different fronts. One of the things that we need to speak about is how bad uh, the um, uh, idea of defending Sinkovka uh, fired, backfired. You know, a lot of people mocked the Russians over Sinkovka, but the uh, fixation of the uh, Ukrainian forces around Sinkovka for so long helped with the current uh, push through uh, uh, Kruglovka and the uh, um, now huge uh, boiler that is being established from Kupiansk to about 20 kilometers down. Once again, and this is not, uh, as I said, this is why why I always mock the uh, chain of command within the Ukrainian army, because the things that they have been doing roughly around uh, September 2022 is losing the bigger picture. Yes, Kharkov was an absolute masterstroke because of the Russians let it, let it be. And Kherson, well, it was also well done, although it backfired because they didn't manage to capture uh, a massive amount of troops or equipment. And then they were forced to stay, you know, locked on the other side of Dnieper. They tried uh, Krinky, it was a uh, shit show. They tried the counter, it was a shit show. They retried Kursk, it's also a shit show. But generally speaking, I agree with you, we should expect the worst from Zelensky. And indeed, a, a Trump backing would uh, radicalize Zelensky even further. But every single result that a radicalized and, and hinged Zelensky has brought so far, has been disastrous for Ukraine. So that's why I said, in a certain sense, the backblast, the uh, recoil from uh, a, uh, I'd say, Trump backing on Zelensky would just hasten uh, Ukraine's demise. And that's why the best part would be for Trump to actually try to act neutral and try to bring peace instead of backing any kind of position. Of course, Russia is not going to back straight up because that's the whole point. But uh, Trump sitting in uh, on the fence would show that Zelensky is actually failing Ukraine. And the fact that Trump multiple times has mocked him by saying he's a great salesman, every time he comes he gets X billions, but there is nothing to show for. This is one thing that in a certain sense is going to hurt Zelensky a lot more than we think. Now, the other problem, uh, and this is the last point, is that I do not even think that Trump is that much interested in having this war going on that much, because for some reason, uh, Trump has always had the good ideas, although the execution has been extremely poor. Uh, for a long while, the, the U.S. would speak about Obama, and before that, George Bush, the U.S. was over-reliant on um, uh, China for actually a kind of prosperity by proxy. 
And during the subprime crisis, China saved their asses, basically. Um, but Trump understood that China didn't save America's ass out of the good, the good grace. It's just because China needed a, a, a cow to milk, and the U.S. was the perfect market for that. Uh, and Trump maybe wasn't the first actually to have that idea, but Trump was the first to elaborate a, a, a clear logic to say that, listen, China is a problem for, for the U.S. We are losing our uh, prime spot. We are losing our number one spot. And in a certain sense, it doesn't really matter if Trump is right or not. Trump is right for uh, the point of view that would see America being the first uh, among the peers. But Trump had the good idea for the actual American nationalist agenda. And it was followed by Biden. Biden went extremely hard on on China uh, the last uh, couple of years. Biden, in a certain sense led the conflict grow from a, a very, you know, hodgepodge effort from Trump and a, a very brutal effort that was uh, actually back firing on the U.S. to something far more uh, pernicious. We had the Huawei situation. Uh, we are having now, as I said, uh, multiple... Um, sanction regime over Russia, despite the fact that, you know, America is literally arming Ukraine, but the Chinese cannot sell uh, dual, so-called dual-use goods or uh, machine tools and stuff like that. Uh, we are getting to a point, as I said, that Trump is, in the worst-case scenario, going to finish that kind of uh, rationality, but it also meant that Trump had the idea to start this. Uh, it didn't take a genius to, like, you know, see the elephant or the dragon in the room in this case. But in the same case, Trump would also go that, say, like, the, our real problem remains China, so what we want is to end the war. How we will end it? Well, if you want a, a logic for that, I'm going to bring you in two cases. First of all, the assassination of Soleimani, which was a fucking blunder, uh, which was retarded, but he did it. And then the deal with the Taliban, which was supposed to be all this fucking uh, miracle, but actually it became a shit show because Trump completely forgot about uh, how to establish a mechanism or tools in order for the, this transition to happen. And of course, a lot of people said, actually, he didn't want it. He understood that they had lost. He wanted to have the, the Taliban to have... Afghanistan back within uh, two to three years. And instead of that, due to the fact that he lost the election, uh, Biden uh, went completely ham on Afghanistan and, and completely failed the situation. And we have the shit show. And in this case, we're going to have the same kind of scenario where Biden completely failed the Ukrainians, and we're going to have a shit show of, of a pullback of uh, American help because. Uh, Trump will want to go to the, quote-unquote, the big prize, which is solving the uh, uh, Indo-Pak situation. So once again, what I meant by that is that Trump might very well uh, be beneficial to the Russians against his will, in a sense, or because he doesn't consider this a, a strategic issue for the America itself. He, and he said or we heard that Trump's team considers this a strategic issue for Europe, Europe should deal with it. There should be the, you know, adults in the room and, and do something about it. But at the same time, this literally means that because of the uh, unpreparedness of European uh, militaries, but also of the European chancelleries, it ends with a, a Russian quasi-absolute uh, victory of course, not a, a, a total overtaking of Ukraine, but with a plan that will uh, resemble a far worse Minsk for Ukraine. Because this time, the quote-unquote peacekeepers, the guys who are going to enforce the peace, is not going to be Europe. It's going to be Russia. And this, once again, would, would just point out, as I said, because, as you said, Trump is not going to be always rational, the method to his madness would lead to 
actually having the European deal with the situation and just get lost. Because uh, we can speak about Merz, we can speak about Macron, we can speak about everyone. The muscle is just not there. The muscle for a European intervention in Ukraine without NATO leadership is not there. And with a guy like Trump saying, you know, you have to deal with it, I'm not going to get involved, then the the biggest problem for uh, the Russians, which is uh, the big American hammer, is gone. Up to a certain point, of course. And Europe is not in the state. You can see the multiple contracts that were uh, spoken about. Uh, Rheinmetall that was supposed to deliver 270 vehicles to Italy. They are stuck in negotiations because Rheinmetall doesn't want to uh, localize production. Uh, Then we have um, details about deliveries of about 100 tanks. It's going to take 10 years. Imagine... What happens is if Europeans try to enforce any kind of peace in Ukraine and lose three, four hundred tanks within four, six months, and suddenly you're bingo, and if the Americans don't want to help you out right away, then you're going to start capitulating and having an even worse loss than just, you know, uh, taking the deal offered by Putin, Trump, or whoever. So I hope the... Uh, response was was adequate. If you if there is something that's you know problematic, you you might uh, you know intervene again. Uh, if not, body is up to you, man. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the newly formed uh, Ukrainian brigades, namely the 150s and plus. Uh, which, as far as I remember, uh, are rather hazy formed. Additionally, about the current uh, territorial defense brigades, which uh, I heard again um, are turned from the infantry brigades into mechanized brigades simply by adding uh, a unit of artillery and a company of tanks, which is which must have some some kind of logic, but I can find uh, can find it, uh, and I'd like you maybe to tell me how and why. Also, there is little to nothing I I have heard about uh, the two hundred or more thousands of newly formed uh, Russian Russian infantrymen and soldiers uh, from the recent expansion. Um, that's all I think. That's all. Oh, uh, when it comes to Ukraine right now, it's you know uh, six and, and matches, man. Uh, they are trying to um, have some kind of backbone by mechanizing brigades, as you said, adding a company and making these, in a certain sense, uh, making these uh, Ukrainian-style BTGs that uh, will have a over burden of uh, infantry uh, and lighter vehicles and less uh, heavier vehicles it's, it's it's some kind of a Potemkin army as it stands right now but because of their in, in this defensive posture they have no problem you know using that meat in a certain sense the Russians is the same in 2022 and early 2023 with the mobilized that they sent uh, in Luhansk and uh, around the uh, area of uh, Kharkov Luhansk uh, border um, but I, I wouldn't bother that much about both territorial defense so both the terror and, and the new newly formed uh, units because I mean uh, let's take the example of the 155th which is supposed to be the French brigade um, their tanks are going to be R, uh, IMX R, uh, 10 RCs so not actual tanks. They're going to be BTRs with a hundred, uh, sorry, with a ninety millimeter gun. What are you expecting from this? Uh, it's it's we are to the point where 
right now the Ukrainians are probably awaiting more material and they're going to try and, and figure out how to uh, equip all these quote-unquote new brigades. The biggest problem that we're having with that uh, is not that much um, who will have what. The biggest problem that we'll have is uh, where they are going to be employed because right now, as you said, they are supposed to be mechanized units, but actually they are not really mechanized, they are mostly motorized. This would mean that these units are, will have to be either uh, used in a, a mobile defense uh, system, or they are going to be used to what happened uh, in Kursk, where, you know, uh, due to the tank losses, you can understand that the tank units engaged were probably less than two battalion stops. Um which means about 60 uh, units of tanks, but uh, motorized, uh, so the wheeled uh, armored vehicles uh, were the norm. Tracked armored vehicles were absolutely nowhere to be seen. Of course, you had BMPs, B, uh, uh, BTRDs, Marders, uh, CVs, and so on, but those were the exception, not the rule. The rule was BT, uh, BTR4s, uh, Strikers, um, a lot of maps. So I think this is where the Ukrainian army is going to go for at least uh, six months now, which is trying to be mobile, have a modicum of uh, uh, protection and a modicum of firepower. And most of, of this uh, fits well with a exploitation uh, type of unit. So basically Russians overextend themselves and then you can run behind them and, and push them back. But so far, this hasn't worked out. So I personally, I'm more looking into the fact that Ukrainians want to give some kind of, uh, you know, force generation boost to their units, but generally it's not going to work that good. Uh, now, as for the Russian uh, units that were mobilized, I have it from good source that a lot of it is being used every single day. That um, the assault, the, the initiative uh, issue is that it's extremely casualty prone. So they have losses, they replenish these losses, these losses, then they recover part of the losses which are not always uh, in the best shape they replenish the units that are supposed to go on the assault, and they keep the, the tension high. And this, in a certain sense, will have at some point to stop, not because, you know, like they're going to go up for broke, but simply because you're going to start uh, touching the co cohesion of your unit and the cohesion of your fronts. Um, the initiative betrayed Russia once already, uh, and that was, of course, the counter in Kharkov, when the Russians were firmly leaning upon their initiative in Lugansk and then in uh, uh, Bahmut. Uh, and they thought that because they had the initiative, the Ukrainians didn't have the assets or the capability to to counter. And when Kharkov happened, Kherson happened, and then we know how it went. But in this case, uh, the Ukrainians had more than enough time to prepare uh, reserves. And the only action that they entertained and they took in, in 2024 was madness. So on, on that aspect, I really think, as I said, logistically, uh, there is a limitation there that the Ukrainians need to solve by mostly having a uh, operational post of at least three to six months uh, in order to, um, you know, reestablish themselves. Because one of the things that we heard a lot, especially now as a quote from the Ukrainians, is that Russians threatened to uh, nuke the Ukrainians. That's why the Americans didn't deliver the equipment right away. But when we uh, see, at least based on Oryx, how many uh, Russian equipment was captured, that was allegedly at their disposal, uh, that makes no sense because the Ukrainians recovered uh, the first 10 months probably far more than they got as heavy equipment for their counter. So 
was the problem. I mean, according to Oryx, over 450 tanks were captured. But the aid from November to, uh, November 22 to April 23 was barely half of that. Because most of the tanks were given 2022, the Polish ones. So, when you compare it, you can understand that there is a lot of cope circulating on the Ukrainian side. And the justification for uh, this cope is pretty simple, is that um, both sides are nearing a, a level of exhaustion. Uh, for some reason, for some very logical reason, uh, Russia uh, has still a little bit more in the tank. And Ukraine right now is, is basically running on fumes, not when it comes to equipment or manpower, but when it comes to the uh, management of both. And I said, if you look at Kursk, you, you look at the hotspots units they put together, you look at the very ad hoc uh, type of uh, tactical outlay, I mean, for fuck's sake, they were using one or two tanks accompanied by a couple of um, wraps or even pickups. Tanks would get uh, blown to high sky. Suddenly the wraps were uh, uh, unable to answer properly. Then they need to pull back, then get another IV or another uh, small unit of tanks, push forward, get ambushed, go back. And then you have this back and forth for almost a month before the lines properly stabilized, and the Russians finally went to the counterattack uh, early September. So once again, uh, the problem with Ukrainians is not that much that they are gonna they are already broken and running fumes. It's simply that the tempo of operations that they are being uh, submitted to by the Russians allow them very little in force generation and conservation. And this is, in a certain sense, why you both seeing these half-assed units on their side, and also why the Russians want absolutely to keep the initiative all over the front for so long. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, on a final note, uh, might be a question about uh, the weather and how it's, gonna, how it's going to impact the, the course of the conflict. Because... Uh, so uh, I, I I missed I missed a part of your question. Sorry. Uh, the signature and of course lack of mobility on one side versus the other. You you mean uh, mobility, uh, tactical, strategic, or just basic uh, bad weather and. Uh, trucks. But yeah, that, that's so no. basically the, the the tactical one. Well, I, I don't think it's gonna uh, affect that much either side uh, because of one main reason: um, the Ukrainian side still has, I think, enough trucked assets to respond for a short uh, period of time, three to six months, one to one to the Russians. But it has to, to choose where it wants to do so. That's why you saw this underinvestment in Kursk, because everywhere else you had to, to use the track, especially um, now that it's clear, we are clearly in the winter phase. We already saw some, uh, some snow tracks there, especially on Trasovyar. But some things that we're seeing is that in Trasovyar, there was a lot of a T8U, or UD, depends, uh, I'm, I'm not pretty sure which one of the two was lost, you are seeing Ukraine pulling out stuff uh, after lengthy reparations mostly, uh, lengthy refurbishment, uh, and also stuff that, you know, was barely donated. So we had the announcement that Croatia was going to give M80s, and suddenly... Uh, Two M80s are lost, one in Trasovia, the other one in the, I think, Pokrovsk area. Uh, then we have the Leopards 1A5, uh, suddenly also having a couple of losses, both of, of them around Mirnograd. Um, you know, the problem with Ukraine is, as I said, uh, the weather can be good or bad, but what uh, determines their um, performance so far has been 
the view, the vision they have, and this is something I said last time on the space, I think the impact on the officer corps on the Ukrainian side is not to be uh, underestimated. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, due to lost armor having stopped uh, the count, we can only say that there are probably somewhere between 4,000 4,500, which, based on uh, the requests of the uh, Russian uh, delegation in March 2022, um, is roughly uh, 60% of the uh, officer corps that was counted uh, from the uh, Ukrainian military is about 7,500, of which probably uh, around 5,500, 6,000 were uh, actually um, in the active uh, uh, situation, which means that they weren't uh, trainers, they weren't uh, formators, they weren't uh, uh, academy officers. They were guys who were basically leading people on, on the ground. They were responsible for the troops. Um, and, and this shows once again that Ukraine is not being decided only by weapons and losses. It also be, is, is being decided by uh, the nature of the fight both sides are, are actually fighting. The Russians ha are having a revolution within the army, but it's still within their norms that we like it or, or hate it. Uh, some would say that the Russian military is showing itself able to change, learn, adapt. Some would say that despite everything, it's a shit show. Uh, I think there is something for both sides in there. But when you see the Ukrainian uh, side, you have a huge problem because a lot of those who are surviving right now, a lot of the officers who are surviving, uh, they are not involved in, in the fight itself. Losses of junior officers in, in, in the fight are not different from the Russian side, but the Russian side have more soldiers. So the uh, threshold of losses on, on the Russian side indicates that the Ukrainians are losing more valuable assets by doing the same nonsense that the Russians are doing. Um, it's just the scale that's changed, and the scale given the losses is not that different which means that the side was being was being impacted a lot more when it comes to uh the officer losses as for everything right now as with uh, armored assets as with planes as with uh, air defense assets is ukraine and therefore trying to find um you know a solace in the fact that mud or uh you know frozen ground is going to help or or uh uh, you know, hamper the efforts of one or the other side. I, I think that those are, are going to be, you know, uh, hitting both sides equally. But what I'm seeing right now is a lack of understanding of each other. So the Ukrainian military or the Ukrainian leadership, wherever they are right now in the defensive, are misunderstanding the intentions of the Russian military. Um, the fact that nobody saw Petrushevka falling and then the Russians going for the uh, trifecta of the cities up north, despite that uh, we saw it in the group. And I'm going to repeat, we are not professional military guys. We do not have 800 billion worth of dollars in uh, equipment in, uh, and, and whatever. We just follow the war in the same way as you. Maybe we are a bit more autistic in the fact that we we, we check both sides and but if we saw it, you are not going to tell me that the Ukrainian military leadership is not seeing it. At the same time, the same happened to the Russians in 2022. A lot of people were seeing some things happening. And you cannot tell me that the, the Russians didn't saw it. So either it was a, um, you know, a Zugzwang in the sense that they were forced to take it. Like, we don't have the troops for that. We are too invested elsewhere. Uh, so be it, you know, they they bit the bullet. And I think it's the same for the Ukrainians, but it's the follow-up that is problematic. The Russians understood what the problem was. Uh, they made some adjustments on top of, you know, grabbing people uh, and mobilizing them. And things gradually went back to, you know, a more balanced side. But for the Ukrainians, what we're seeing is that despite everything being 
crystal clear, the answer that, that they're giving, the lack of actual sense that they're making, this is what is hurting me. Because I, I, I've said this multiple times, where is the Zesu that, that did so well encounter both in March and April 2022 and then in August, September, October? Yes, of course, then I made uh, critical strategic mistakes after those initial gains, but that's something else, you know? Here, you have a compound of mistakes, you have a compound of problems that you can tell me whatever you want, you, we don't have the assets, we don't have the ammunition, we don't see it. That's nothing to do. You are lacking vision, you are, you are mistaking uh, the Russian intentions, or you are lying to the public. I mean, the Pokrovsk push that is happening right now, a lot of people foretold it a year, two years ago. And nothing was done to defend. What, and a lot of people say, yeah, but, you know, Russians have more means. And No, bro, no. The, the thing is, look at many areas of the front. Look at how Chastovyar is difficult. And it's true that Chastovyar has this uh, canal that is a good protection. And because it's in a height, it, it allows them to, you know, be a, a lot harder not to crack. But Avdivka was like that as well. Avdivka was a fortress, and they still lost it. And of course people are going to say, yeah, but the Russians sacrificed this and that. It makes no sense. You just lost 540 square kilometers in southern Donetsk after defending Ugledar like crazy for two years. And then we come back to, as I said, either you are in an exhaustion phase, either you made a huge mistake by Kursk, which is compounding, either simply the new officer, the new uh, cast of leadership that has been trained with this Western vision in mind, is training the new guys with thin air. That you go there to think that you're going to have, I don't know, uh, uh, Death Stars, Baba Yagas and shit, but in reality you have uh, four poor Lelekas, about ten Mavics, and you are bailed out by HIMARS and FPV guys. But strategically, you're getting pounded every day. And this is the whole point I'm, I'm saying for a, a long while right now. Uh, it's true that it's hurting to see the Russians get hunt, hunted by FPVs. It's, it's, it's awful to see uh, hardware getting, you know, spotted and hit by FPV and burning. But despite all its successes, I we see that Ukrainians are being pushed back with losses, huge losses. We did the uh, averages year in, year out. And based on those losses, the Russians haven't done that bad, given they were on the offense for the whole year. Compared to 2023, so you, you can deduct there is learning there. There is um, maybe more means, maybe more, uh, you know, experienced people. But this contrasts with how Ukraine is, going, is doing worse, which in defense they're losing more equipment, which is uh, the exact parity between what Russians are losing more by being the offense, which Ukrainians should lose less by being in defense. But in, in fact, they're losing the same kind of amount as the Russians who have the initiative. We're speaking proportionally here. We're not speaking about the Russians losing 5,000 and losing 5,000. I'm saying that the Russians are, are losing uh, less than a vehicle per day extra for the year 2024. And the Ukrainians, in proportion, due to their you know uh, 2023 losses, are losing the same thing. It's not supposed to be like that. And indeed, Kursk adds a lot to the, the problem, but in reality, it's just the same. Ukrainian defense is ill-conceived from the top. And I know it's, I, 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 I was a bit lengthy here, but I just wanted to tell you that trying to fixate about, you know, uh, hypothermia, uh, about um, the mud season and so forth and so on um, goes against, you know, what uh, we've seen for now four winters, winter 22, winter 23, winter 24, and going to be winter 24, 25. 
the Russians started their war in February, had November, uh, December 22, January, February 23, then had November, December 23, uh, January, February 24, and now we're in November 24, and they're going to have uh, the rest of 25. And nothing stopped the the warfare on both sides. Ukrainians tried to push as hard as they could in December and January 2022-2023 in order to, you know, break through Kremina and Svatova and so on. And they failed. Russians started Ugledar in January 2023 in some of the worst conditions ever. It was a failure, but... What I mean by this is that none of them stopped trying in the winter, despite everyone saying that the warfare is going to slow down and this and that. Avdivka starts in October, and the heaviest fighting for Avdivka is end of November, mid-January 2024, when we got the uh, spelunking breakthrough, and then the city falls in February. And I think what you, we're seeing now, especially with Kursk, is that it, it's not stopping both sides from doing it. Probably it's going to be a slowdown because of the losses, and both sides are going to try and have some respite. But right now, I do not see any kind of uh, impact on, on, on the war. And on top of it... Um, one of the things that you are right uh, now, both sides, both sides are using more smaller vehicles, higher pressure, higher ground pressure. But both sides have the vehicles for as long as they remain Soviet to be able to still uh, move around during the mud season. And even Western systems, like the Leopard, was was attempted to be used in November last year. They lost. Uh, a few around Avdivka. Then they used the uh, uh, Abrams also around Avdivka and started to lose them like crazy. Like, I don't think that it's going to be less. The only thing that's going to change, honestly, is, as I said to you, if the quality of the uh, Ukrainian leadership doesn't change, um, weather will not have much to do with with the performance. And of course, if if you got you got some kind of snag with the uh, supplies, or if the Russians start to hit more uh, often uh, the rear area, which would reduce the available um, equipment and supplies. But yeah, that, that's that's more or less what I think. So I don't think mud's gonna affect much, and motorization is gonna affect much. What is going to affect a lot more the war phase, uh, the current trend of uh, Ukrainian military of having. Uh, in my opinion, less able uh, junior officers and and uh, commissioned officers. Yeah. So yeah, guys, uh, I'm sorry it was a bit longish, but yeah, but it is on. Uh, if you have anything else to add, uh, be my guest. Otherwise, uh, I will uh, have to uh, basically say goodbye. So that's what it is, guys. Uh, oh, Andre, please go. On. Yeah, I just wanted to, if it's okay, just touch a little bit on the matter. How is how is Torets doing? Well, according to uh, Cope State. Oh, by the way, I I want to add one last thing. Um, I I want I wanted to make a. Uh, uh, Copset L series because um, the last couple of weeks it has been uh, almost insufferable. Uh, they've been holding back losses. We have geolocations of Russian troops five, six, eight kilometers away. 
there are whole swathes of Kursk uh, that are gone, but that COP state still uh, holds um, under Ukrainian control. We got uh, lies, but lies that are also in some in some weird way passed through multiple mouthpieces of the Ukrainian armed forces. Officer Plus, I said to you guys, uh, and uh, Snapper Gavarit were like, yeah, we had advancement in uh, Shaktarsk, uh, but I don't know how, if we're going to be able to solidify them. And then the location comes the very next hour, I think, from Crimea, and you see that the Russians have pushed them two kilometers westwards, and you're like, okay, this is a different type of thing. It's not just cope. They are lying to their public. Um, so, yeah, this is one thing I wanted to say. If you want to follow Deep State, you think that Torsk is being a bit stalled, but at the same time, he's forced to give away, you know, small advances on the Russian side, especially on the dead center of the city. Then there was the whole logic with Zabalka being counterattacked, the Ukrainians taking over other positions, which was based once again on FPV strikes. And those FPV strikes, most of the time, they don't, they don't prove much because, as I said, on the same time, FPV strikes from both sides sometimes show very deep positions. Uh, one of the things that happens is that a uh, FPV strike uh, footage from the Russian side sees strikes almost 600 meters from the alleged current front line in Zabalka. Uh, and another footage from the Ukrainian side shows uh, strikes well beyond the current uh, line from deep state. So Torsk right now is being fought extremely hard and unfortunately one of the things that is transpiring is that for Torsk they should have advanced from Druzhba and tried to get them around and the uh, attempted attack from Leonidovo uh, once they had uh, the whole of New York uh, petered out mostly because they need to cross uh, a, a body of water there, and yeah, if you are pushing mostly by uh, foot mobiles, well, it's going to become extremely complicated. But Torsk in itself is a lost city for Ukraine as it stands, mostly because uh, the envelopment around Torsk is progressing in a very negative way for them. And Cop state themselves are understanding this. That's why you have this huge ass gray zone almost everywhere, which doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. But unfortunately, we'll have to cope with these assholes for a long while because uh, I. It's not that I don't trust pro-Russian uh, mappers. It's just that I, I've learned my lesson from 2022, and I rather be you know, uh, wrong in the good way, so basically actually uh, underestimating Russian advances than doing the country, overestimating them and ending up with uh, situations like like the latest one in Serebrianka, uh, uh, Veko Kamanske, where we don't know where the troops are, how it works. Uh, we have flags, we have geolocated positions, now we have the push from uh, Ivano Dari, uh, I think Ivano Darivka from, uh, Ivano Darivka from the southern salient, the Vimivka advancement. So the thing I, I, I want to say is that uh, Torsk is going the way it's going because the Ukrainians are, uh, for once fighting, although uh, urban fighting and Ukrainians, uh, usually doesn't matter, uh, doesn't mix that well since probably the start of the war. Um, but uh, I would, I would, you know, oppose any kind of judgment right now if you have to base it on uh, general mapping. Because, as I said, right now I understood that it's the easiest way to fool people by, you know, anti-dating uh, footage, posting old footage uh, to, you know, to cover for failures on both sides. I'm not saying that Ukrainians are the only one to do it. Uh, then you have idiots. Uh, reposting the same footage multiple times. We had Iznanka reposting the same uh, Bogdana destroyed three times in three different angles. Then we have Dvapidora posting old shit and new shit together. And you're like, how the fuck did the Russians just cross seven kilometers, man? Well, it makes no sense. Uh, 
Then we have footage from September in Kursk being reposted, which if you have to geolocate, you say, oh, suddenly the Russians are uh, almost in uh, Suja, you know? But once again, like, uh, Torsk is going its, its own way, but please be aware of both sides' mappers and try to use the one that you think it's the worst for your side. In this case, pro-Russians should indeed uh, use deep state because right now we are mostly being um, pleasantly surprised by the coping and the fact that they're taking so many L's by uh, lying, stalling and and hiding the real uh, extent of the damage. Yeah, that's it, man. Well, thank you. No problem, thank you're you. welcome. Guys, uh, if you have anything else to add, please, otherwise, yeah, it's, it's done, and we see each other probably somewhere uh, at the end of next week in November, uh, because, as I just told you, uh, Gay Forcher uh, announced that the Russians are counterattacking massively in Kursk, and we would have the results probably uh, by the end of next week. Thank you very much. Have a nice uh, day, evening, night, whatever. Bye-bye.